like, I am really, I have, I'm really good at this, the rejection part. The other ones you, you, you might have seen me deliver the other workshops. Uh, I'm okay at those. I'm really good at this. Uh, so, so I, I, uh, I, I'm really happy and really excited. This of the, I, I'm really excited to do all three of the workshops I was doing this time out. But this one I was really looking forward to. It's a brand new one. This is the first group who's ever seen it. Okay, so what are we going to do today? Talking all about rejection. So uh, for those of you who uh, attended our revisory submit workshop, I'm going to do a very brief primer on peer review covering some of those topics that we talked that we um, went over at the beginning of that workshop, but modifying some of it uh, for direct relevance to uh, the context of, uh, of rejection. Then I'll lay out uh, a perspective on how to think about rejection, because some of those aspects of getting papers rejected share some commonalities with other editorial decisions, but some important differences, and we'll, uh, we'll go over those as well. I'll then lay out a strategy, uh, a, uh, a sort of three-part strategy focused on uh, uh, or applying those, that, per, that, that uh, perspective of rejection towards what you actually do with the paper after it was rejected. Uh, no strategy, no discussion of a strategy is complete without actually seeing how it manifests in real life. So what we'll do after the, the strategy discussion is that uh, we'll take a little bit of a break uh, like, a, like a few minutes, five, 10 minute break. Uh, I posted several materials relevant to the application portion, that part, that part um, six portion of this, uh, uh, this workshop on Dropbox. And I'll, I'll, po I'll, I'll show you the, uh, the, the, uh, the QR code next in a second. And that's of relevance to an actual rejection story that, that, that I'll lay out for you that, that happened recently to our team. And then, uh, you know, feel free to ask you uh, uh, questions, uh, you know, as, as it comes up, please try to keep keep the uh, questions to clarifying questions now and then later on we can do more substantive ones. I, I, I left plenty of time for questions, given that we have uh, we have uh, roughly 90 minutes. Okay, so uh, this is the QR code to things on Dropbox. Um, if you if you uh, uh, don't have QR codes, uh, please uh, uh, feel free to um, uh, 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 let me know. Actually, just in case, I think I have the, uh, the Dropbox bit.ly link here. Let me repost that just in case people are just getting here now. That's the, uh, the link to the Dropbox folder. That's the, that, that, that's the QR code here. And the, all the materials are, are grouped by day, so you can just go to Saturday and you'll, and you'll find it. Okay. Very, very brief primer because I want to spend the grand majority of our time on strategies. I'm just going to do a, a quick overview of peer review as it relates to, to, uh, to rejection. So all throughout this process, it's really important to think about rejection in the context of those who made the recommendations, and, and namely the reviewers and the, uh, the action editor, the editor who handled the, the, uh, the, your manuscript. Uh, who is tasked with identifying those reviewers. So they're the gatekeepers. They're the ones who are, who are, who are judging whether or not a, a, a certain paper ought to go past the first submission process into a revisory submit pay, uh, a phase. And so it's really important to think about these, these folks and identify strategies for, for navigating the process, knowing full way that there's some things within your control as an author, but some things that are outside of your control. Like I mentioned before, uh, on, on Thursday, uh, you know, peer review, as it uh, manifests in academia, is designed to be a quality control system, but it's a little bit different than other quality control systems that you might have been, you might be familiar with. So any of us who have products in our houses uh, or, or, or in our possessions, you have a, a mobile device, a tablet, you have a sofa or a table, you know, if that was if that um, product was made by a pretty large company, some, a company with an infrastructure, 
not to think about quality control. They've, uh, they, they, cr they create infrastructure within their companies to identify whether or not the product that they made uh, functions the way it was intended uh, uh, and importantly, with this safe to use. And, you know, in those quality control systems, like uh, Samsung, uh, a few years ago, created a phone that unfortunately burned holes in people's pockets. It, the battery overheated. You know, in those contexts, it's really easy to understand where quality control went sideways because you see the evidence right in front of you. Burning phone means something went wrong in the quality control system. Uh, the instrumentation on a car go, go, goes haywire and, and, and somebody can't use it. That's a, that's a, a flaw in the, in the quality control system. It needs, it needs to be corrected, typically. And that's where recalls and things like that happen. Peer review is quite a bit different. There is a quality control system, right? There's, there is an infrastructure. But unlike the burning phone scenario, there's no version of the commentary you get from peers where you say to yourself, if I make this change, this one change, that will produce a tangible benefit to my paper because a lot of it is clouded in subjectivity. Um, you know, reviewers bring in their own perspectives, their own areas of expertise, but also a lot of the, the, the comments they make don't necessarily uh, translate to objectively improve, objective improvements uh, under all circumstances. You have to keep that in mind when you're thinking about peer review. The other thing you should keep in mind with, with, with regards to peer review as it relates to rejection is that it happens a lot. It's the most normative thing that you encounter in academic work. The reviewer's work gets rejected, the editor's work gets rejected, the author's work gets rejected, everyone's work gets rejected at some, at some point and happens a lot. Uh, you know, yeah, and the data is right there. So if you look at the publication rates, the rejection rates, of journals, for instance, in the American Psychological Association, I mean, you'll see rejection rates on the right-hand side of the screen that range from 34% to over 90%. You know, you think about that. It's a journal of applied psychology. They reject nine out of 10 papers submitted there. So what does that mean for any, piece, any one piece of work that we submit? If it gets rejected, does that mean it shouldn't be published at all? Well, well surely not. Uh, if you submit it to one place, uh, because the data just isn't all that good at that point to say, well, maybe this isn't even publishable. And so, and then the reason why that is, is that there are so many different places in the process where, where a decision can be made that can result in a paper getting rejected that otherwise probably be a really good piece of work that should be published, if not at that journal, somewhere else. And so, you know, a problem can, 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 uh, can arise if, uh, the editor in chief chooses reviewers that just didn't have a good area of expertise to handle your paper and, and a variety of other things. So we'll get to those those elements of the review process as we move forward. But we're going to be spending the the, uh, the a sizable chunk of our time thinking about all of these elements of the submission process, from where you choose to submit your paper to what the editor decides once they've already made a decision about your paper. We'll talk about all those things and everything in between as it relates to these, specifically to these reject decisions. So I'm going to lay out a perspective on rejection. It is not the only perspective. It is just one perspective, but it's also a perspective that I suspect uh, there's some consensus on among academics, at least in, uh, uh, among those with whom I, I frequently uh, speak and collaborate. And what I mean by postmortem? Well, you know, there's an aspect of this reject decisions, these reject decisions that revolves around the idea of, you know, we spend so much of our time, we pour all of our expertise, all of our effort, all of our passions and motivations, all of our energy into these papers. And so when we get a decision back uh, from these papers, we're often waiting for months to hear uh, advice, uh, 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 feedback about a paper that you might have been working on for years. And so, you know, getting that, uh, getting bad news about something that's so near and dear to, to, to what we do and, and what we're about hurts at a level that, 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 that feels akin oftentimes with other aspects of loss in our lives. So 
so we so the perspective that I that I have with this stems from that notion of you know th this is a really difficult set of circumstances to deal with not just cognitively but emotionally as well. And so I'm going to lay out three principles that are relevant to this this sort of general perspective on rejection. One is that rejection in the context of manuscripts is very different from rejection in other contexts. So take for instance. Uh, submitting grants to funding agencies. So each of our areas of expertise oftentimes might be relevant at the federal level to one, maybe two, maybe maybe for some of us all three of the major funding agencies uh, in, at the, uh, in, in the federal government. So I'm thinking about the National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation, the Institute of Education Sciences, you might also think Department of Defense, Department of Justice, there are several other different kinds of agencies, but they're finite. There are only a handful of folks who, who have uh, a handful of these agencies that have funding mechanisms that are relevant to, to, uh, to our work. And in particular, these kinds of training grant applications that many of you uh, might be submitting in grad school, maybe you can be submitted in grad school or in, your, or in postdoctoral training periods, you can count on one hand with several fingers to spare the number of agencies that are, that, that are, that are gonna be interested in these kinds of applications. So if one of those gets rejected, you often just don't have a lot of options after that uh, in terms of where to submit. Manuscripts are very different, especially in, in the context of mental health research and especially in youth mental health, uh, you know, where, where the options that you have to submit papers don't just traverse the clinical uh, journals, but also the, the youth-specific journals, the broader clinical journals, Sometimes in youth mental health, you can submit, you can submit uh, papers to developmental journals or counseling journals or social work journals or family science journals. The, the number of journals available to us are Im uh, immense, almost to the point where you can make an argument that, that any one paper, unlike grant applications, has nearly unlimited chances at, at, a, at, at publication. And so when you get a reject decision from one place for your one paper, it's, I mean, it's kind of like what, um, uh, what Carl Sagan uh, he said. So, uh, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Is your work unpublishable? One reject decision is not extraordinary. They require, you, you need more, more, uh, more uh, uh, reject decisions to get to a place where you're like, maybe I shouldn't, I shouldn't pursue this any further. Another thing, and then this is something we went over in uh, uh, in the Riser Submit workshop, but but I want to bring it up here because the context of rejection you know, as it relates to peer review uh, leads to some important differences in decision making when you think about um, uh, peer review. And that is, you know, to go back to this idea of reliability, reliability peer review is really, really low. It's remarkably low. Uh, you know, if you look at studies like the Schicchetti paper in the early 90s, they took papers that were published, uh, you know, at a journal, I believe it was Brain and Behavior Sciences, and they took a sample of new reviewers, fresh reviewers, and they took those accepted papers and had them review it. And the kappa on the, on the reject decision was very, very low, unacceptably low. We, none of us would be able to get a, a paper, a, a paper, a study that included behavioral codes with this level of, ca uh, of kappa or diagnostic um, codes with this level of kappa would be laughed out the room by our reviewers. You wouldn't be able to get that. The, uh, uh, people wouldn't be able to buy the fact, the, the idea that those scores would be precise enough uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, be address to be used to address research aims. That's how bad peer review is. You also see with, with, uh, with grant submissions, the Marsh et al. paper in 08, really great paper. Another really great paper, there's a paper um, by, uh, I'll upload this, uh, this paper um, uh, later on, uh, but it's a paper by, uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that basically shows that, um, this is back in 2018, the author's first name starts with P. I'll, I'll, I'll upload it later on, but um, the, uh, the reliability of grant submissions, at least in that study, was not only low, but the predictors of successful grant success had more to do with the reviewer characteristics than the actual grant submission. Right? 
our peer review system in many respects just isn't uh, um, uh, just doesn't pass threshold on key metrics, namely with precision. And what that means for a paper rejected by a journal is that unlike Roger Smith, where the where the advice that I gave uh, people on Thursday was, when you get the decision to revise your paper, try to do try to move mountains to do every single thing the reviewer says. Because they're because it, it, you know the likelihood is very very high they will be that they will be a reviewer on your next paper, on your next submission, that you can't say that about reject decisions and we'll talk a bit about that in more detail later on. And the last thing, you know, and going back to this idea that rejection in the context of academic work is a is a context of loss, uh, and it's a universal experience. We all. Uh, uh, do it if if you haven't gotten one of your papers rejected uh, 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 in, uh, in 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 the youth mental health space or any space where, where you publish in, you're not submitting enough. <laughs> it's basically what, what it amounts to, uh, you know. Um, uh, uh, and, and so in that in that respect, this is something that that we all encounter and that we can oftentimes uh, lean on on other people for support because they've experienced, they, they can have this, they can empathize because they have had the same experience as you've had. In case in point, uh, our lab's last rejection happened about a month ago, uh, you know, a, a, month, a, a month ago uh, uh, as of yesterday. Uh, and, you know, we're in the process now of revising the paper, revising the paper and sending it back. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm following, I'm doing a lot of the things that, that I'm advising you all to do in the next, in the next sections. And so, you know, this experience is basically like a, like a loss decision, like losing a loved one, like, like, a, like, a, like, like losing um, somebody in your family or a pet or something like that, you know. And so in that respect, it's really important in these contexts to treat these experiences as akin to a, a mourning process. And, and, and by that, I mean, you know, when you get the decision, so let the paper sit, let it rest for a few days, create some distance between you and the work, so it becomes a little easier to sort of uh, sort of uh, uh, engage engage um, systems other than your, than your emotional system to to to, uh, to sort of react to things, and then to seek out support from others because as I mentioned before, all of us experience this. So there there are lots of uh, of, of people in in our in our in our work lives that we can lean on for for support and for and for uh, uh, for advice. And then key key in the next steps, which we'll go over in succession in the next in the next section uh, sections of this, is to prepare to scrutinize several aspects of the review process, not just the reviewers and the editors, but also what you might have done or not did, and then to plan a way a plan a way forward. We're going to go through each of these things now um, uh, uh, in succession. But uh, before we move on, do uh, does anybody have any questions about what we've gone over? I just remembered the name of that of that um, author of the um, the that that paper and proceeding. So I'm going to upload that because I know where it is. I try to spread the word on these kinds of things. People should know people should know this work exists. If you haven't seen this already, I love this paper. Uh, it's a really great paper and proceeding from a few years ago. Basically, I, I cannot believe cannot believe it. The a reliability of peer review for grants is low. B some of the best predictors of of, of grant success is who the reviewers are, not the content of the application. <sighs> what a mess. Um, so so uh, so we're going to go through each of these things. So the first thing we're going to do is is uh, is is uh, talk about strategies that involve drilling down and scrutinizing the review process itself. So when you get your, your paper rejected, after you've given it a few days, a few days uh, uh, rest to separate yourself from the work, start off first with the action editor. Whenever you get these decision letters back, you always get uh, uh, the, the, sig the um, signature line of the uh, editor who handled the paper. And so uh, what I always suggest you to do is go in first Look at the action editor and start getting a sense of of uh, of of who of who they are and what they know. So, what's their area of expertise? Does that area of expertise look like the kind of area of expertise that that mapped on to to your to the area of expertise for your for your paper? 
they may not know your content area specifically, but do, do you have the sense that they probably had enough knowledge about what you did to identify reviewers who could provide a fair evaluation of your work? Okay. So, so the, trick, the trick first is figure, you know, get a sense of, did it look like they might have had the, 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 um, uh, the uh, sufficient amount of expertise to figure out who might review the work? Now, the action editor is somebody that, that, uh, that, that reveals themselves when they make the decision to you. The reviewers oftentimes don't. Sometimes you'll see a reviewer that, that, lists, that lists out their name, but, but that's a rare occurrence still. You, you, you more often see um, anonymous reviews uh, from, uh, from reviewers. But I'll drill down to their comments. In their comments, do they give you a sense that they knew that that that, uh, that they knew your area of expertise, and and did they feel and can you get a sense of what their area of expertise might might not might not be? Now keep in mind, action editors oftentimes will select reviewers that vary across these spaces. So some and we'll go over this in a few minutes. Some sometimes an editor will select their, will select like one reviewer with specific content expertise. Sometimes it'll be like just a methods person. Maybe they don't know the content area, but they know the methods really well. Sometimes they'll just get somebody who's just a really good, uh, you know, reviewer that can provide commentary on things, even when it's outside of their expertise. They can find a, a, a way to sort of link your work to really good clinical or research implications about from the work broadly. So, you know, when an action editor selects reviewers and, and they know your content area, that doesn't mean that they'll pick three content experts. They might pick one really good content expert and then a couple of other experts in other areas. After you get a sense of how the, what, what kind of expertise the reviewers had, I would drill down and look at the, at the comments themselves. Did you get, um, you know, a pure set of constructive commentary? Every piece of, every, every comment was conveyed to you fairly and it, 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 you know that you got a sense that the reviewers really want to make your paper better, but they also recommended that it probably isn't a good fit for this journal for 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 reasons that they that they revealed in their comments. But was there something in the reviews themselves that felt off? The tone what was more destructive than constructive, you know? And the, and that isn't were they were they giving you critical feedback? It's more were they giving you critical feedback that had an edge to it. They could have left alone because at the end of the day, reviewers don't attend reviewer school, right? Uh, for the most part, they learn from an elder of theirs, a former mentor or something. And oftentimes our first reviews as reviewers ourselves are typically cull reviews, you know, like a like show of hands here, you know, who who's um who's reviewed a paper before? Anybody, anybody want to want to say? Yeah, raise hands. Okay, so Alana's uh, 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 um, uh, reviewed papers, Ma uh, Maciel's reviewed papers, Hannah's reviewed papers. So lots of people reviewed papers. Uh, another another uh, uh, question among you, among those who reviewed, were was your first review with a mentor? Did you did a did you co-review with a mentor? That's that's most of us. I mean, that that was my first review. My first review was a, was a uh, was a was a co-review with actually my first review was a co-review with Mitch Princeton when Mitch was at what was that was a uh, was at Yale the same place where I went to grad school, right? And so that's how all of us uh, you know typically start. We typically start with these co-reviews, and thankfully, my men my 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 first co-review experience was with a really good reviewer. I mean. Me, me, Mitch has been in, uh, was the editor in chief of this journal, associate editor of several other journals. Mitch is also a really nice person, <laughs> so so it also that, so so you know I got exposure on how to do this kind of work constructively. But that's not true of all people. It all really depends on on whether or not those early experiences um, uh, acculturated you to a space of. I'm here to make this paper the best it possibly can be. If I recommend reject, I recommend reject, but I'm still suggesting uh, and making constructive suggestions as opposed to uh, it's, uh, it's supposed to making people feel bad, whether I mean to or not. So, 
So sometimes that, that, that all that stuff happens. It's important to, to, to take a look at whether or not the comments were conveyed harshly. And sometimes that, that might give you a, a, a sense of what to do next. And then sometimes it's not just one comment. The whole thing felt off. I mean, I, we've, we've had, I, I actually showed a couple of examples of that in, in a, on the Thursday workshop. We, I, we get them all the time. That wasn't the last time that, some, that, that, that somebody was particularly harsh to us. It just, it, you know, it, uh, it's more often the case it's just a, a harsh comment here or there as opposed to like the whole thing feels off. So, so, you know, those are really important reviews to drill down on because you might not know who the reviewer was, but you might be able to drill down to, make, to take a guess about what aspects of the work they took issue with. Maybe the harsh framing stemmed from the theoretical framework you, you use in your introduction to describe, uh, the, to, to provide a conceptual rationale for the work. Maybe it's, it's the measures you chose or, or the conclusions. Did the conclusions you drew from the work were they inconsistent with uh, with a with a um, a widely um, uh, 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 known view or or a set of findings from a particular group that your work is in conflict with? Sometimes that that might give you uh, ideas about who to recommend as reviewers when you go to uh, to uh, to submit the paper again. We'll talk about that a little later too. Here's the other thing, and it's and it's and it's especially true. It, during the pandemic, but it, but this is a perennial thing. Sometimes you can get a sense of whether or not something went awry with the re, with the review process on a reject decision based on how long it took for the decision to come back. All right. So when a review process takes a really long time, it's not always the case, but usually the case that it was because the action editor had a really hard time finding reviewers. <laughs> that's happening a lot more. I mean, I, I mentioned uh, on Thursday that I, I, at least at JCAP, I'm probably, I'm thinking that we're taking about 50% longer to get review decisions back to people. So we used to take about two months. Now it's looking more like three months. And then part of it has to do with the fact that even when you do get review, reviewers to say yes, which JCAP does a pretty good job of find, uh, uh, getting, uh, getting reviewers in part because reviewers know after reviews have worked just a little while, they know that, that we have a pretty high desk reject rate. So when they get invited to, to review a paper, that usually means that like it's a pretty good paper. They might still recommend rejection, but it'll, it won't be an easy, it, it won't be like, a, like an easy call. It'll be a hard call. So, so we'll typically get a, a lot more yeses to review invites than no's. But even the yeses, I mean, look, I mean, it's, it's COVID. It's still work from home. It's still I I I gotta I got I gotta do this for the kids and this thing, you know, and everything takes longer. Um, you know, there are elements of these decisions beyond the timeline that could give you a sense of whether or not it was just really hard to find reviewers for it. Like, if you only get one review, most places they'll 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 try to solicit two or three reviews. So maybe the reviews were very short. They cut they 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 were they felt kind of cursory to you. They didn't they felt like almost like they didn't read the paper very thoroughly. You know, that, that could have been, that, all those things could be signs that the action editor probably had a really hard time finding reviewers. And again, this, this, is, this is, especially now, not necessarily a reflection of the quality of the work. It's more to do with the fact that it's just hard to find people to do free work because, because reviewers aren't getting paid for this stuff. So, with this section of the of the strategy, you know, I want, to, I want you to sort of train your attention on this idea that 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 when you do a post mortem on 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 a rejection decision, you have to take a look at the, at the review process itself. That it might give you ideas on where to go next, uh, and and you might see spots spots of the review process that that might have looked pretty unfair. Right? Um, uh, that doesn't mean that that when this happens, those are the only reasons why your paper got, got rejected. It's also important to take a look at what uh, at, at, at decisions you made uh, during that process, because the combination of, because usually any one rejection decision is a combination of these two things. It's rarely the case that it's one or the other. It's probably a little bit of both. So, so the next part, we'll talk about scrutinizing the actual, uh, the, you know, your, your role in this process. The first thing you start off with is just go back to the journal. You know, take a really good look at the journal that you submitted to, its aims and scope, 
take a look at articles published in the last few years, take a look at the editorial board. You might have done that for the first submission, uh, but I would go back and relook and, and, and reevaluate, even if you did. Because um, uh, um, uh, look, I mean, I can say this uh, in particular with regards to my own work. Uh, you know, there have been occasions where, where I've worked with my team to work on a paper. We're really excited about it. We shot for a particular journal that we thought was a great fit. And then when the reviewers came back, we were like, you know, those are fair critiques. And in hindsight, I think we, I think we shot, uh, we went to the wrong place. You know, that, that happens. You know, yeah. so it's, it's important to sort of assess your confidence because oftentimes, especially with the first submission of a paper, we oftentimes have, we, we oftentimes are really excited about the work and it, and it, and it, uh, it takes hearing back from an audience, the reviewers, to get a sense of whether or not we were actually judging the, 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 uh, the, um, the, uh, the work in a fair light. So then, you know, in this context, I would go back a couple of years, you know, particularly with the new editorial board, like relatively recent papers, scan the papers, scan the topics covered, take a look at the study designs, take a look at the references that were cited, and, and, and note any kind of differences between your paper and papers published in the journal. The, uh, you know, if you see any differences, was that, uh, did those reflect the reasons why the paper was rejected? Maybe not, but, but doing this, doing this might also give you ideas about where to go for your next, for your, uh, for your next um, uh, journal submission. So there may be a context where you see a disconnect between your paper and, the, and, and papers published in the journal. You know, sometimes that disconnect has to do with things like maybe you use a theoretical frame that, that a lot of the other journals, uh, a lot of the other articles in the journals might not have used. Maybe there are certain study designs that, 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 that don't tend to be reflected in those journal, in, 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 a, in articles published in the journal. That doesn't mean that any decision you made was right or wrong. What that means instead is that at these journals, oftentimes the authors are also reviewers and vice versa. And so this is a, a community of people. They don't have the right answers. They don't have all the right answers. They have their own answers. And since you're writing these, these papers in the context of a community that's going to evaluate it, it's important to sort of look at the similarities and differences between, between your work and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and what's typically represented there, because it could give you a gauge for what to do next. And, and, and the uh, one really important thing I want to stress here, when you see these differences, that doesn't mean change your stuff to fit what they, what, what, uh, what, what they do. It's, it, it's more, it's more akin to, you know, get a sense of, uh, of where your work fits within the audience that will evaluate it. The analogy I often go to is, is, uh, is stand-up comedy. So, um, uh, so I personally think that Michelle Wolf is brilliant. She has a particular kind of comedic style that caters to a particular kind of, uh, of, uh, of, of comedic audience. Not everyone finds her funny. And even within the context of, 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 her, of her work, like my like uh, like uh, like my favorite of, of her specials is Joke Show, really great, uh, really great on Netflix. I think it probably still is. Um, but Wolf is like a lot of other uh, uh, comics in that when you see the actual special, the thing on Netflix, the thing on Hulu, that's an act, like an hour long thing, with a structure that has coherence, almost like a lecture uh, that we might deliver in one of our classes. And that lecture doesn't get finalized for a while. I mean, when, when you see the special, that's only after, uh, you know, M Michelle Wolf has tested specific elements of, of, that, of that act with crowds that where, the, where things weren't filmed. She sees how they react. Maybe some, some, some uh, parts of her bit land. Maybe some of them don't. They're not, they're not seen as funny. She refines it based on the crowd's reaction. It's almost like she's repeated. It's like an, it's like a, it's like, a, like an EMA design basically. <laughs> and then she's refining this stuff as she goes along. She's tailoring it. She's engineering it so that when it's ready, when it's optimized for, for, for maximal reactions from the audience, hopefully positive reactions from the audience, then it's ready for the special. Then it's ready for something being televised. 
there's an important difference between how comics pursue their process and our researchers have their process. We can revise and revise and revise our papers before submitting to that first journal, right? We can do all that. We can do a ton of revisions in-house, rely on our colleagues. Maybe you can seek out input from, a, from, a, from somebody who wasn't part of the co-op and we have them provide an evaluation before we submit it. But you don't get to submit and resubmit to the same audience, to sit, the same set of reviewers until they like it. Uh, you know, uh, until it's a garbage or submit process, like that first, that pre-reject manuscript doesn't get, you don't get to see the feedback until you see the feedback, right? So there's no, there's, there's no, there's, there, there's no way to handle the audience issue in the same way as a comic does, but we can take some guesses, right? So once, once you find the journal that, 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 if, that where you, where you fit the work, it's important to sort of figure out how to revise the paper so that you reach the audience uh, that that uh, that might be used to seeing the kind of work that that, that that you're producing. So this is where looking at the editorial board of the journal you plan to submit uh, uh, is is really really important. You want to get a sense, given that that editorial board probably provides a representative sample of uh, of the kind of audience you're going to be speaking to. Really get a sense of is this paper and the way that I'm going to revise it the kind of thing that that the reviewers at this journal might be used to seeing. And then write the paper with the idea of I'm going to guide the reviewers to what I expect them to see, the aims of the study, my theoretical frame, uh, you know, the, the study design that I use, you know, and at the end of the day, this is what I'm going to reiterate this again. The reviewers of a journal tend to be authors of papers that the journal publishes. Really, really important. That doesn't mean that the, the action editor will only select authors to review papers. It's, a, it's, a com, it's, it's the most likely scenario. In a, in a submission process where the reviewers are probably going to be people who've authored papers there before. And the trick is to, to get these reviewers who have baseline uh, probably find value in the kind of work that you do and turn them into advocates, advocates of your work, as opposed to gatekeepers. Because it is, at the end of the day, when reviewers who are known to provide fair evaluations of, of, of people's work, when they run into a paper that they really like, they tell editors, they, they don't hold back. They really like it. Whether they, meet, whether they mention it in the actual comments or mention it in private comments of the editor, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll, make people, they'll make people aware of it. I alluded to this idea earlier that when an action editor selects reviewers, they don't all select the same reviewer, right? Uh, you know, they, they might ex uh, uh, show a, 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 con a content expert you know, somebody that knows the content area really well, maybe, maybe as much as, as you do, a non-expert. So somebody who can, who can speak to the sort of general implications of the work. This, this is particularly true. A non-expert is particularly likely to, to show up in a, um, uh, in a circumstance where the, uh, uh, you know, the, the journals are top tier, kind of broad journals as opposed to specialty journal. You're probably going to get a non-expert there as well. And then somebody who knows the methods uh, really well. So, you know, really good, really good comics and really good authors can, can sort of think about how to write papers in such a way that you're appealing to all these different kind of audiences. Um, uh, and then for those of you who, who may run out, this is Maria Bamford. Maria Bamford is brilliant. Watch anything she does. She's really, really funny. Um, uh, and, and has a knack for, 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 for trying to appeal to different kinds of audiences as well. She's, she's both, she's both, you know, uh, you know, quirky and 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 has and has some kind of like a, a, a appeal across audiences that I, that I very much admire, and all these things really get into the space of thinking thinking about um, making sure your paper makes a compelling account or story of the work, right? So the the idea is to think about these papers as uh, as a way to control. The reviewers thinking guide them towards the kinds of things you want them to focus on and there are ways to sort of increase the likelihood that that actually happens you know so uh, so going back to some of the writing mechanics work that we that, that we covered in, in in my writing mechanics workshop yesterday so if you didn't see it and um, we'll post it on on uh, uh, on our formal on demand channel later on but as you as you're revising the paper go back sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, and, and ask yourself, you know, do, you know, did each of these paragraphs start off with a meaningful topic sentence? People had a clear idea about the intent of that paragraph. You know, each sentence logically connects to, ne to, to the next sentence. 
really important. This, this is true for grants and especially for papers as well. When you use a really important term uh, in your paper, like um, anxiety or mood or, uh, or structural racism, uh, you know, you want to make sure that that term means the exact same thing throughout the paper. You know, you want to make sure because the thing is that reviewers for both grants and papers, the one thing they have in common is they're trying the best they can to give you advice, but this is one thing on a hundred other things in their plate. So you want to, you want to be able to, to drop as much things that might load onto them cognitively where, it be, where it's really hard for them to attend to things. So get rid of it when you, as you're, as you're working on the paper, think about, are there things in this paper that, that were like shiny objects, like squirrels, like, oh, did they, so they used anxiety here and fear over here, or they used depression over here and mood over here, or they used structural racism here, but systemic racism over here. Like, like, uh, like, does that mean the same thing? I, I, I don't know if I follow very quick. Like there's, 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 there are very, even minute things in these papers that can oftentimes divert reviewers attention away from what you really want them to focus on. And one of the big things is make sure that everything in your paper, the use a term to, to, to define a concept, use that same term throughout the, throughout the paper. Or mention the people that you're using them interchangeably. If you want to use more than one term, just say it like, uh, like, uh, like this one or this term or that term. And then each, and each, each of these paragraphs are the hint for what's going to, what's going to follow. The, the workshop we did yesterday was, a, was a, you know, went over all of these material, well, all these things. We'll post it in a few weeks if you didn't see it. You know, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, there's aspects of these papers and you, you'll see it sometimes in reviewer commentary where you say to yourself, it's, it doesn't feel like it was an act of commission. Uh, it's more of an act of omission. I missed a few studies here and there on this topic. I might have said very little work was on this topic and a reviewer came back and said, actually, I can, I can find just four of them just by a simple search is like a four of the papers that, 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 that address a very similar topic. You know, that sometimes um, those might lead to reject decisions in their own right, because then a reviewer might say, well, do I have any confidence that this is that this paper is producing new knowledge that wasn't available from prior work? Right. And, and so, and so there, um, you know, uh, you know, you want to make sure that, that, that when, you, as you write in the paper, go back, you know, do 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 a revised lit search. See if you if you missed anything. You might or might not have, and then and then uh, plan a way forward. So, so you know, in this in this context of re of rejection, you know, it's important to look at the process itself, but also what you could do because going forward, you're going to have all the control between now and the next submission, the next place where you're going to submit. This is all the decisions that happen in between here and there are all within your control. So the, the uh, you know, this next act is all about what are you actually going to fix? What are you actually going to revise? What are you actually going to do before you submit this paper again? The trick, the first question is, what should I revise? Like I mentioned before in the, in the advisory submit workshop, there, the answer to this question is easy. Do your best to fix every single thing the reviewers suggest you do, every single comment. And if you can't do it, come up with a really good reason for why you, for why you can't do it, right? But here, these reject decisions are very different contexts. Uh, you know, not just because all the news is bad. You might have gotten good feedback, but it was still a rejection. You still have to go somewhere else. Um, there's still some more work ahead of you. And the reason why the, the answer to this question isn't the same as Reiser Smith goes back to the reliability of peer review. The reliability of peer review is very low. The Reviser Smith process in, the, in the, uh, the publication process is the saving grace of peer review because even though the, the, uh, the process is unreliable, this is the Reiser Smith process is the one place where you have some kind of certainty. If I fix these things, in relation to what reviewer two says, or what reviewer one says, uh, reviewer one or reviewer two is probably going to be reviewing or reviewer two on my next submission to that same journal, right? But you're taking your paper and submitting it to a new journal. In that place, the likelihood that reviewer one on the last submission is also reviewer in this submission 
is not high. It's not zero. That reviewer might be a reviewer in the next submission, but they might not for a variety of reasons. Maybe you submit a new a, a paper to a new uh, to a new journal, and that reviewer one is not on the editorial board of the other journal, or is not commonly a reviewer over there, or that reviewer was identified as a reviewer by the action editor for the next submission, but that reviewer says, you know what, I already reviewed this paper before somewhere else, so I'm going to decline. So a lot of reviewers do that too. They they'll just say, I already gave a review of this. Um, I want this review to get a fresh evaluation. I'm going to stay out of it. All right. So, so you can't really count on reviewers on any continuity in reviewers from the last journal to the next journal. And what that also means is that reviewer one on the new submission, you can't count on them having the exact same concerns as reviewer one in the last submission, let alone reviewers two and three. All right. So what that means is that unlike the advisor submit decision where you where you just do everything they say, here if that, doing whatever doing exactly what they said in the first submission might actually hurt you. So case in point, what if reviewer one absolutely hated table one? They didn't like the way you wrote the table. They didn't like the, they found it confusing as hell. They didn't like column one, column two, column three. They gave you they give you they spent they spent the grand majority of their review talking about how much they hated table one. And let's say you fix table one. In, in line with exactly what reviewer one says. Reviewer one in the next submission might hate your version of table one. Why? Because they're two different people. And it's a stylistic thing oftentimes. And so, and so in this context, you really want to start off with this idea of, it's not my job to fix everything they say. It could actually hurt me on the next submission if I do. So then the trick is to work with your co-authors to figure out which comments should you revise make a prediction it might not be perfect make a prediction if i don't fix if i don't address the the, the paper with on based on this comment am i going to get the same comment with the next submission for several of the comments in your paper that the answer might be yes the answer might be yeah i mean if you don't fix this another review will have a problem with it but then there might also be some some comments that are more stylistic that, you know more like a reviewer preference kind of thing maybe like a tone kind of thing where you're like, you know what, that, that's more a stylistic preference thing. If that same reviewer uh, is, 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 is invited, maybe they'll, they'll take issue, but that might not be one that everybody's going to have an issue with. Uh, uh, I'm going to address this question uh, uh, quickly by Tom, but if a reviewer shares a different philosophical orientation and suggests major changes, is it worth making the edits and explaining your position or finding a different journal? So uh, good, uh, good, uh, good question, Tom. So in that context, uh, you know, uh, if you think it was a philosophical sort of difference that, um, that uh, and, and might not reflect a fair evaluation of the work, you could go back to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, the editor. The problem might be is that the editor might agree with that philosophical stance. And, and, uh, and in, those, in those kind of contexts, an editor might say, uh, uh, you know, uh, my decision stands. Uh, if you're able to say, I can fix everything except for this, this one comment, which might reflect more of like a philosophical difference between labs, that an editor might say you can send it back. But it, under most circumstances, that kind of comment should tell you to A, maybe consider a new outlet, but importantly, B, think very carefully about which, which, which reviewers you might recommend for the next submission. We'll get, we'll get into that in, in a few slides. Does that help? Okay. So now, now it's time you, you took a look at, you know, what should I change? So make a decision there, and then, and then where should I go? Sometimes the nature of the changes, and importantly, the nature of the things that you probably aren't going to change, might dictate where you'll eventually go in terms of the new submission. So, so you might have re, you might have looked at the reason and realized, ah, this is not the right audience for this paper. Um, maybe I shot too high. That's possible. Uh, you know that that isn't necessarily a decision that you make under all decisions, just because a top tier journal said no to your, to your paper doesn't mean other top tier papers wouldn't, wouldn't give it a fair evaluation and might even wind up publishing it. So I wouldn't necessarily take uh, one rejection from a top tier outlet as saying to yourself, maybe I shot too high. It's really more like the nature of the comments, 
and 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 where your options lie as you as you as you figure out what to do next. You know, uh, and and sometimes you know the difference between high impact and and uh, and uh, and and, uh, and, uh, and lower impact journals or, or lower tier journals has something to do with with less about the quality of the journal and more about the fact that the audience is more specialized versus broad. I mean, because there are great, I mean, there are fantastic specialty journals out there uh, with really high impact factors, really, you know, really wide readership. And at the end of the day, you know, sometimes this, the, the first time you get a paper rejected, you might say to yourself, even if I got it into a top tier journal, that's not the place where people are going to read it. They're going to read it at one of these other specialty outlets, one of these other kinds of outlets where the audience is, uh, is used to seeing these kinds of papers. And, so, and, and sometimes that makes a huge difference in terms of where things are, where things are, are found and read afterwards. So, you know, some, some, some ideas on where to go. Some of these, some of these ideas I, I conveyed on, on Thursday, but, but, but some things are more, more specific to these contexts. Like, so, so I would first look back at the reference section of the paper. Are there any kind of journals that repeatedly come up on the papers you cite? At the editorial boards of those of those other journals, do you start seeing reviewers where you're like, that reviewer has content expertise in my area, that person might provide a fair review of the work. This is also a really great place to turn to turn to colleagues about about where to consider. And the other thing you can do is 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 a uh, is this happens a lot. I mean, I get I get um, uh, inquiries like this all the time uh, at at JCAP. You can always send the abstract of the paper to to an editor. To an editor of the journals. I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, editors accept papers they like, and if an editor gets a, a query from somebody with their abstract and says, "Does this fit the aims and scope?" An editor can't say right off the bat, "Yeah, we we publish that," but they can say that fits the aims and scope. I would need to see the first the full paper to see to see if this is something that we would that we would send out for review or not. But uh, but but it at least gives you an idea of. Uh, you know, you could get an editor that comes back and says, maybe not here, but here's a few places that might suggest. And that, and that, and editors are really motivated to respond to these kinds of, of inquiries uh, in large part because they want authors to make good use of their time, but also reviewers and, edit and editors to make good use of their time. I think I saw, I think I saw a question come up. No. No, no, no. And now, you know, like I mentioned on, on Thursday, you you uh, you should always assume, always assume that editors appreciate suggestions from authors about reviewers. We love this. Oftentimes, it's the case we'll get papers, and we might know the content area. We might know, uh, you know, we might have people on the editorial board who uh, who uh, who have content expertise there. But we oftentimes are ignorant of several aspects of reviewers and their connections to authors or lack thereof. One, um, conflicts of interest. So sometimes we might think to ourselves, this reviewer on our board would be perfect for this paper, but we might not know the area well enough to know that that person is connected to the author team and so much should perform. They're a previous collaborator, maybe they're a former mentor of, of an author on the paper and they, and they can't review it. So getting Reviewer recommendations is great because we always, you know, you know, and, and, and we, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, we obviously assume from the get go, we'll check, we'll check before we, before we invite um, for certain, but we always assume that when authors are sending us reviewers, reviewer recommendations, that those reviewers are not like personal friends. They're not people, they're people who don't have conflict of interest. So, so when you're making these recommendations, you have to make sure that the person doesn't have a, doesn't have a connection to anybody on the team. And so assuming that you're making these recommendations of reviewers who have no conflicts of interest and who know the expertise at the area really well and know and know the the and can provide a fair evaluation, you know, you try to identify two to four reviewers, even if they have a, an option to do so in their submission portal, which which many journals now do, I would still put it in the cover letter. Uh, and it looks a little bit like this. You know this. Uh, uh, you know uh, this is the. By the way, all these these little bits and pieces of, uh, of cover letters and stuff are, are in are in the Dropbox folder 
for the Roger Smith um, uh, workshop from Thursday. So if you wanted to uh, wanted to go uh, uh, find these, they're they're over there. And you know, conflicts of interest can traverse a variety of different domains. So one, the obvious one is, yeah, you can't ask former mentors. You can't recommend former mentors. You can't recommend collaborators, collaborators for you, collaborators for other people on, on the on the author group. You know, uh, but the other conflict of interest might might wind, might come up from um, you thinking to yourself that a person who either provided a, an evaluation of a paper, a paper of mine, uh, you know, uh, you know, or somebody who I know in this area, you know, maybe you work within an area of study where where quite frankly there are politics among the reviewers. Maybe there, there are teams that uh, author teams or investigative teams that know their content area really well, that produce high quality work, but between investigators doing high quality work, uh, there's a clash in, in philosophical differences, in the theoretical frames they use, in the, in the treatments they might, they might, they might um, evaluate in their studies and the measures they use, you know, in the conclusions they draw from their, from their findings. And those things don't get at quality. They get more at, I, this team just doesn't like what this team does. And, the, and, and those aren't, you know, those are rarely markers of quality, right? They can be, but they rarely are. And so, uh, you know, in, in that, in this context, if you discover somebody in your area of work, area of expertise, who you think is a not reviewer, it's incumbent upon you to, 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 to raise that as an issue. If for nothing else, it educates the editor on, on, on some of the, 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 the political structures that, that are embedded in all of our research areas. Everybody has one of these. You know, everybody has at least one. And so the, the trick is, if you can identify these kinds of people, um, you know, you don't need like prima facie evidence that they've been unfair to you. You might have some idea they might be, uh, but where, whatever you do, as you articulate it in the cover letter, it's important to note that this is a philosophical difference thing, not a quality thing. It isn't that like 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 a, like a, like like you want people out of the process who who can who can identify, um, you know, um, study design issues or any kind of things in, in reference to the work. You you want this to be a a true philosophical difference that has that bears no relation to the quality or merit of the work. You also want to make sure that the that you don't put it just in that person. It's it's both of you. It's a philosophical difference for a reason. It's a it's a it's a clash not due to one or one or one of the other persons, but but for both people. And in that context, you have to assume that if you think your work might be evaluated unfairly by that person, by extension, you should probably assume that you can't be objective in evaluating that person's work. And, and, and so when I uh, talk about this stuff, when I make recommendations like this, I go as far as to say that, that, that if I think that person is an author on a paper and I'm invited to review it, I just decline it. I just decline it because I just don't think I can be fair. And so, and, and uh, I have examples of all that stuff in, in, the, um, in the Dropbox folder from a couple of days ago, the, the uh, advisory submit uh, workshop. So okay to, to identify these not reviewers, just be, just don't, I, would, I wouldn't cite 10 of them I, I, I'd, I'd cite a, a, a handful of them, but also give advice on which on who might provide fair evaluations. So, you know, it's important to figure out what to do after these rejections. It's really hard, uh, you know, and 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 at the same and and at the same time, you know, the nature of the revisions can actually really help you about what to do next. Um, so, let me make sure how are we doing on time. Okay, good. All right. So, uh, what I want to do with the last with the last half hour is um, uh, what we can do is like a five minute break. I want to make sure that we that that, uh, that we have enough time for questions at the end. So instead of like a, like a ten minute break, let's do like a five minute break. And in the Dropbox folder, in the the uh, the uh, the Saturday session, in the reject decision folder, I have a handful of documents in there that are relevant to the rejection story we're gonna go over, we're gonna apply the strategies to, the, to, to, to that particular reject decision. I'm gonna give us about five minutes to look at those, at the, at those, at the documentation over. I've purposefully identified 
a recent rejection of a very short piece of work, only like a, like about a thousand words or whatever. I included the rejected paper, the decision, and then and and, and then uh, and then another another piece that's relevant to uh, to this as well. So let's take about five minutes to look that over. We'll come back in five minutes and and uh, and, uh, and 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 um, absorb and and work on the material on the other side of that. Set my timer for five minutes. Starting now. So, uh, quick question: uh, Who among you saw the stuff in the in the in the uh, in the Dropbox Dropbox folder and thought, "Oh yeah, that paper sounds familiar." Had anybody seen the paper before? No. So, so before we get into it, I, I really want to thank Lucina Uden. Lucina uh, was actually a um, uh, uh, gave an address at last year's Future Directions Forum, and uh, and and a lot of the rejection stories stemmed from uh, from Lucina and I working together on that forum. Uh, last year, and so she, she, I asked her, um, Workins rejection workshop, are you okay with uh, with um, uh, with me using it as an example for this workshop? And Lucina thought, yeah, that's totally fine. So, so really special thanks to Lucina for being okay with that. So, in the Dropbox folder, you, you saw that the, the the a copy of the paper that was the original paper that was rejected uh, for publication, and then a copy of the reviews. And so, you know, a key element of the paper had to do with this idea of, you know, we have certain traditions in, in academia that we rely on to make really important high stakes decisions about admitting students to doctoral programs, about hiring faculty into those programs. And so the paper revolved around this notion that there's some data to indicate that our current traditions um, don't necessarily carve a path to success, and in fact, they they might actually create a lot of the um, uh, the issues with uh, having a diverse academic community. There are various aspects of our traditions that might be posed barriers to those kinds of things, and there and we may be in a spot now where it's important to think about overhauling them and reimagining them in in, in, in significant ways. So that, so the the key goal of the paper was to sort of contribute to this conversation of, of thinking about how to shift our evaluation models with a focus on, on increasing the holistic nature of the evaluations, not just relying on a handful of metrics for which there isn't really strong evidence we should rely on them anyway, and spreading out the evaluation process to include other kinds of domains beyond the traditional ones like grades and test scores and, and whether or not in the case of faculty hiring, whether or not, whether or not the papers that the that the candidate produced were, were, uh, were published in particular kinds of journals. So we submitted that paper to uh, you know, a top tier review journal in, uh, in, uh, in, in academia, Trends and Cognitive Sciences, really great outlet. Um, we actually reached out to the editor who handles the commentaries ahead of time to get a sense of whether or not they were interested. We got some really good feedback and then revised the paper um, uh, uh, according uh, to what the editor thought we should attend to before we submitted, and we submitted uh, in the fall of last year. Uh, you know, it only took a month to get the reviews back. That was really neat, but the downside was that we were rejected. And you know, the, the reviews were mixed at a place of trends in cognitive sciences. We typically might expect uh, the uh, the paper to, uh, to to require universal, universally positive comments, even if they they did necessitate. Uh, changes, uh, but we had a mix. Uh, the one reviewer liked, generally liked it. One review didn't, um, uh, to a significant extent. And you know that that obviously produced a uh, created a mourning period for Lucina and I. We we were really motivated to work on the paper. Actually, we're working on a new one now, uh, focused on on mentoring that we're really excited about. But but you know we were really we we this is our first paper together. We really enjoyed the conversations that led up to the paper. The process of it was very positive. We really enjoyed it, uh, but we, we, you know, we we had hoped the paper would get in 
to this journal and it wasn't that with the success that we had expected. Uh, and so, you know, the good news was that, that we, uh, uh, that we got constructive feedback from the editor and the reviewers and, and we, and because the reviews were mixed, our sense was, you know, in all likelihood, this is a reflection of the audience, the, the, uh, the, the academic audience that would eventually read the final version of the paper was going to fall into a couple of camps that revolved around several different aspects. And those camps could wind up, you know, you know, having a strong sense of cynicism about whether or not we could reimagine the, the evaluation process, practically speaking. And may, might even be, have been skeptical about uh, uh, the notions we had about what we could do to reimagine the process. And, and, and we thought to ourselves, well, we can't just ignore that and just submit the paper again without fixing anything. We should, we should sit back look to see which major issues uh, came up, which things can we revise here, which things can we, uh, can we let go. And so there was an aspect of our, of our first submission that we thought produced an active omission. You know, there's a portion of the, of the paper that deals with trying to leverage data to make informed decisions about, about, uh, about, uh, about um, these admissions and hiring decisions. Uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, one of the reviewers took issue with the idea of so you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna downplay the evidence base for a set of metrics that we're using now, and then reimagine the process to include metrics which you don't have any strong evidence right now. But right now we should use, right? So so uh, there was a tension there that we knew we had to directly directly attack, and and uh, and and uh, and and get into this idea of uh, you know you know you know there is a way to create evidence based decision making paradigms that don't lean on having all the evidence in before you make the change, right? There is a way of, of, of leveraging evidence in a more dynamic, in a more dynamic way. And then we needed to provide a vision for what a dynamic evidence-based gathering process might actually look like. You know, what, what could it actually be if, if, if we know full well that, that, that a key element of these holistic evaluation processes is starting the, is starting making revisions to these processes in our, in our, in our, admission and hiring decision paradigms without having all the evidence come in, uh, come in before we act. And then we thought, what specific things should we fix? Well, as you, as you might've seen, reviewer one made comments and even, and reviewer one said, you know, full disclosure, I'm making a couple of comments here that the authors might not have room to, to bring up. And we, and we agreed with them. It's like, actually, there were the, the things that were raised here actually pr probably were outside the scope of what we intended of the ideas we tended to, we intended to share with the audience. And, and, and it was where reviewer two came in where we thought this is the most critical review and it's, it's, it's directly relevant to the kinds of, of ideas we're trying to share. So we, so we, uh, we decided to make a series of substantive changes in the next submission that dealt with all the things that I talked about before. And then after revising the paper, we thought, well, where can we go now? A place that takes short commentaries like the one we prepared um, with, a, with an outlet of similar impact to, text, uh, to trends in cognitive sciences, because just because they rejected it didn't signal to us necessarily that, that a top tier outlet wouldn't take it. Right. So, so we resurrected the paper and submitted it again uh, uh, about a month after we got the reviews. Uh, we submitted it to Nature Neuroscience we, we got very great feedback. Um, there's a, a particular paper in that, in that uh, outlet, in that paper, there's a particular study that we cite in that paper that was made aware of to us from the editors. The editors pointed us to a, a, a recent pair by Barcelo and colleagues uh, in, in, uh, uh, in medicine that was an actual holistic review process implemented in a training program for medical residency. And that paper was a, was a really nice proof of concept. It showed their process. They compared a holistic review process to a traditional quantitative process. Like us, medical residency applications have a quantitative exam, not the GRE, but something, but something akin to it. And then they also have, there are also the possibility of collecting other kinds of data that aren't specific to these standardized, these standardized scores. And relative to the traditional review process, the, the, the process, the holistic process tested in the Barcelo and colleagues paper um, resulted in, in, in doubling 
the number of underrepresented minority candidates who got invited to an interview. It was a really nice demonstration in another area of, of work uh, about how we might think about this process. Now, there are aspects of, of, of medical residency interviews that overlap a little bit with our own, with processes in mental health um, uh, doctoral programs like PhD programs, but but other some, some other important differences. So it also gave us ideas about how we might think about the evidence gathering process, knowing full well that not all of these holistic review processes will look exactly the same across programs. It was, a, it, was it was great, and that that advice came from the uh, the the editors. It was, a, it was a it was a really nice piece of advice. We got the original decision uh, to uh, um, uh, uh, to uh, uh, to revise with the paper uh, on the 18th, and then after a few months, it, it eventually got in. The, that QR code is, it took, will take you to that to that paper, and and you know the the, the paper's gotten really nice, uh, really nice response. It's, it's been downloaded o- o- over 10,000 times. Uh, I've, I've had comments from a lot of a lot of colleagues that they've been ta- um, reading the paper in in faculty um, uh, discussions. Uh, in faculty meetings, uh, I'm giving I'm giving a short presentation at the Council of University Directors of Clinical Psychology Cut Cup at the end of this month that revolves around uh, this paper and thinking about holistic review processes and more specifically decision making surrounding whether or not to include the GRE as a submission requirement in applications coming in the next season. So, so we, you know we're really happy with the with the end result. But all but all that came from basically applying the same strategy that that, that we outlined earlier today. And so the, you know the the trick of the, all this is, is that regardless of the 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 nature of your work, regardless of how long you spent the, uh, writing a paper, preparing a piece of work, the the rejection process is going to sting like crazy. It never goes away. It doesn't matter how experienced you are, you will not run in and out of a year not having a paper rejected unless unless you you submit only once or twice so the, the, the more you submit the more likely it's the case you're going to get you're going to run into this stuff but but it's also a key element of our process this, the, the all these processes went in making the work better even if it went to being initially that that the paper was rejected and then that's that's what this is making process strategy processes come into play in a significant way now here's one thing I want to mention before before we go to questions. I want to make sure we, we go to we we have a few we have about ten minutes for questions. But you know sometimes these reject decisions might get you in a place where where you say to yourself, I I have to shift the focus of my work. I have to figure out where uh, to take this paper next. Maybe it makes me hesitant about about a particular area of work that I'm focused on. And you know these are all tough decisions. I'm of the opinion that reject decisions. It's a space where you say to yourself, what part of my work is this signaling to me that I should compromise on? And what point, what part of this work should I say to myself? I, I don't care if it's rejected. I'm going to keep on pushing and, and, uh, and, uh, and get these ideas out. Because that, that's what it really, really uh, amounts to. Just because you get a paper rejected, just because you, know, people, you get harsh commentary, doesn't mean that those ideas will not value. And in some cases, those ideas have so much value uh, and, and it's the rejections that are a signal they have value. And by that, I mean, you know, acad- academia, academic work, oftentimes the, the big discoveries, the big ideas come to us, come to the field because one person or a handful of people sees something. That the rest of the, of the of 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 the academic community just doesn't see yet. That happens a lot. If 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 Caspi and Moffat just said, you know what, this gene environment thing, maybe it is nature or nurture. Maybe, maybe it is one or one or the other. If if they didn't stick stick to their to, to their principles and push that work forward, we would probably be having a lot of the same conversations we were having 30 or 40 years ago, nature or nurture. Their work demonstrates it might be a mix of both in a lot of in a lot of what we see in in uh, in in, uh, in psychology, uh, and in a variety of other areas, allied disciplines in mental health. I mean, I mean and, and you the, the, those are that's just one of many other examples that, that you'll see in in uh, in, uh, in 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 work in mental health. And so you know sometimes you compromise, but sometimes you say to yourself, I, I don't care if people are rejecting this. I think I'm seeing something the rest of the uh, the rest of my colleagues don't see, and it's up to me to make sure that it, that that idea stays out there. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, knowledge knowledge doesn't benefit from it. All right. Um, so, 
you know, I, I feel free to ask any, any questions you might have. We have about 10 minutes before the poster session, but I, I, I encourage you to, to, to share uh, whatever you'd like. If you want to share your own rejection stories, you want to ask additional questions, um, uh, you know, always excited and, and, and particularly excited to, to, to hear your reactions to this one, because as again, again, this is the first time we've, uh, we've offered this particular, um, this particular workshop. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I hope this was as fun for you as it was for me. I, 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 was, I was really hoping this, this one would, would land well. Um, and, uh, and thank you so much for all of your time. And I'll, I'll see you all in the poster session.